Welcome to our podcast series, Five Questions, Five Answers, in which we explore recent U.S. trade policies and U.S. trade rules that can affect thousands of companies. We have a goal in mind to help you, the listener, translate the legal into real-world business strategies. My name is Bridget Matheson. I'm the Director of North American Manufacturing here at Aaron Fox Schiff in Washington, D.C. I get the easy part. I get to ask the questions and I get to choose the colleague or the guest I know will have the right answers for you. So in the next few minutes, I will ask five questions that reflect the concerns we've been hearing from business leaders. All who want to understand the rules, but they also need to mitigate their business risk while increasing their bottom line. So let's start. It's October. And there are very few days remaining until Americans head back to the polls. And much is at stake. That onslaught of campaign ads has been relentless. Americans, and frankly the world, are wondering, will January 2025 bring a Trump 2.0 or a Harris 1.0? And let us not forget that this year, in congressional races, 34 Senate seats and all 435 House seats are up for grabs as well. And so for corporate executives who are listening here today and who have a strategic eye on the U.S. marketplace, this election cycle and these turbulent times, well, they're bewildering. And bewildering is never a good thing when millions of dollars in production investments are at stake. So no one has a crystal ball, but my guests today are as close to the political landscape as any here in Washington. As a matter of fact, I think their offices overlook the White House were that close. First is Dan Renberg. Dan is a partner and co-leader of our firm's government relations practice. Dan is a former legislative director and deputy chief of staff to a Republican senator, and in addition, He was officially appointed by President Clinton to serve for three years on the board of directors of the Export-Import Bank of the U.S. And he served in that capacity for both the Clinton and George W. Bush administrations. Joining us also is Kelsey Griswold Berger, and she is the government relations director and working with Dan. Kelsey spent 12 years on Capitol Hill in both the House and Senate, and immediately prior to joining our firm, Kelsey served on the staff of Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina, where she advised the senator on, yep, trade and tax issues in his role on the very powerful Senate Finance Committee. While working in the U.S. House, Kelsey spent five years as a legislative director engaging on matters related to trade, tax, and yes, foreign affairs as well. So I have a first question, and I'd like to ask Dan this one. First of all, Dan, Welcome to our podcast for the first time, and thank you for uh, for joining us. Thanks. I'm really excited to have this opportunity to chat with you and Kelsey uh, about such important issues, and I'm glad it's a podcast and not a video on YouTube, since I've been told I have a face for radio. <laughs> and much ink in the media has been spent describing the importance of this year's election and the stakes that are involved. But in terms specifically of international trade policy, how do the two presidential candidates differ? Well, it's a great question, and it's one that we spend a lot of time on here at Aaron Fox Schiff in the government relations practice. Uh, We have a number of clients that ask us that very question, you know, on a daily or weekly basis. Vice President Harris is an interesting candidate from a trade policy perspective because she had some time in the Senate, but trade was not one of the issues that you would immediately think of. Uh, and you know, she was so active on the Judiciary Committee, for instance. She voted against USMCA. And so there were only 10 senators who did, and she was one of them in, in part because in great part because she cited environmental protections that were inadequate in her mind. So we don't know a lot about her core principles on trade from her Senate time, I don't think. And then as vice president, she has not been president. And We can assume that she would uh, want to continue a lot of what President Biden has done on trade, which in some cases was an extension of Trump era trade policies. She'll have her own mark. And I I think that our our colleagues here, including 
two former senators and a former congressman. I think that our consensus is that she'll be a bit more predictable in the area of trade than others, and that she will certainly take environmental protections into account. She probably will want to try to work with other, uh, you know, within multilateral institutions uh, on this. And uh, we think that uh, China uh, will occupy a significant amount of her attention. Former President Trump, if he is elected again to the presidency, has made it clear that he wants to take a very, very activist approach, actionist approach. Uh, he's talked about imposing uh, tariffs uh, on numerous products, uh, possibly ranging from 10 percent to, to even as high as 20 percent uh, or more. So we, what we see there is someone who might make trade a real cornerstone, a centerpiece of his daily activities, whereas with uh, Vice President Harris, I think that she's going to be looking at a much broader set of issues each day. But former President Trump routinely speaks on trade. He's been ably assisted by former USTR uh, Lighthizer in terms of thinking this through. We know that there's a focus on the trade deficit. So um, I think that uh, it might end up being a little more unpredictable. But certainly if Trump were elected to the presidency, I think that every day we would see some news in the trade area. I agree completely. Turning to Kelsey, first of all, let me repeat what I said to Dan. Welcome to our Five Questions, Five Answers podcast. Thank you so much. I have been a listener of your podcast since joining the firm, and I'm excited to be a guest today. Right answer, Kelsey. Kelsey, a lot of speculation has been expressed by many people that uh, President Harris might leave lean heavily on the arsenal of trade tools. I think that applies to a Trump 2.0 as well. But for a President Harris, it would be to further her goals on climate change, as Dan has mentioned. These tools are heavily employed, usually in the form of double-digit tariffs, especially tariffs on imports from China. Do you think that President Harris will prioritize new trade to deal, say, with the EU that support or favor trade in cleaner products and meanwhile raise hurdles on, I'll just use the term, dirtier products. Uh, what are you hearing in Washington? Great question. And there's a, a lot of layers to, to peel back here in this question. Um, I think one item that a lot of people in Washington are wondering and thinking is in the event of a Paris administration, how many White House and USTR and Department of Commerce officials will remain on from the Biden administration into a possible Paris administration? Specifically, would this be a Biden 2.0, especially as it relates to trade. When you mention trade tools, one thing I think of is during the annual president's trade agenda hearings that the USTR ambassador uh, is required to do annually in front of the Ways and Means and the Finance Committees. In those trade agenda hearings, Ambassador Ty has repeatedly said that she believes trade agreements are outdated tools, which has garnered a lot of frustration from members of Congress on both sides of the aisle because they see our allies negotiating free trade agreements with each other, especially to get a leg up as geopolitics changes situations in different regions of the globe. So I am not sure how trade agreements would play a role. I do think we could see a continuation of trade deals. I'll loose, use that term loosely, such as what we saw with the U.S.-Japan critical minerals agreement and something that has attempted to be similarly negotiated with the EU, the Indo-Pacific economic framework. Those are just examples of, of non-free trade agreement trade deals that the current administration has negotiated that members of Congress aren't necessarily opposed to, but they would like some input and they would like some stronger enforceability especially as you mentioned, in terms of environmental protections. Some Democrat members of Congress remain skeptical of some of those trade 
deals and how they will be enforceable in terms of environmental and labor protection. And finally, with regard to the EU, I mentioned the critical minerals agreement that the Biden administration has been negotiating with the EU. I would also mention TTIP, which negotiations began under the Obama administration and were halted under the Trump administration. We did not see TTIP negotiations revitalized under the Biden administration. So I don't think under a possible Harris administration, we would see TTIP brought back to life. We uh, received a few questions from our uh, business friends over the latest few months about John Podesta's announcement, I guess it was the beginning of the year, at um, the university summit. And he was announcing the formation of a climate trade task force. And in his speech, he used the words, the problem of trade. I agree with you, Kelsey. It's the language, it's the lexicon that is being used today that is quite confusing because they're not technical terms. The Inflation Reduction Act has something called foreign entities of concern. Um, Other trade topics are friendly nations and nations with security pacts. It certainly raises the, not the shackles of business executives, but they don't know what to make all of this. So I completely agree. Uh, 2025 is, um, is a year to watch. And on 2025, Kelsey, I just wanted to follow up. The USMCA has been mentioned in this conversation. It's up for a mandatory, quote unquote, review by, I think it's summer 2026, but that means that in 2025, um, Ottawa, Washington, and Mexico City will be greatly engaged in the consultation with business leaders about what should remain, what should be left out, what to change, what to keep. Very important opportunity. It was negotiated under uh, then-President Trump. Dan mentioned Senator Harris voted against the USMCA. What are your thoughts on where the candidates now stand on the USMCA? We tear it up and start all over again? Or what are you, what are you hearing? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So Senator Harris did vote against USMCA, but I believe that many in Washington think that it is working, that the enforcement net mechanisms in place are are working. I think Again, depending on who a Harris administration could put in to key roles, I would not see a total tearing up of USMCA under a Harris administration. Under a possible Trump administration, USMCA uh, renegotiated on a NAFTA was a a huge win in the eyes of the Trump administration and many Republicans in Congress who voted for USMCA. Seeing the issues that were happening in, in other parts of the globe, many folks have acknowledged that, you know, nearshoring industry into Mexico and Canada is the best thing to support the U.S supply chain. But then you see headlines recently, um, you know, Trump threatening double digit tariffs on Mexican import, which obviously double digit tariffs on those products from Mexico are permissible under USMCA. Statements like that coming out of the the Trump campaign are understandably concerning um, for business executives. But Trump really promoted himself and, and many Republicans in Congress would agree that he was he was a deal maker and he he found allies and in strange places on various items while he was president. So I would not go into a possible Trump administration fully counting on him ripping up USMCA, but perhaps trying to negotiate a a better deal in his view. Yeah. And so, Dan, let's get back to those congressional races. They are as important in many, many aspects as who sits in the Oval Office. And so I think our listeners would be interested in what your take is on how Congress might look like. And especially, I think, who is going to chair and lead those powerful trade committees such as House Ways and Means and Senate Finance, what their 
priorities might be for the next two years and possibly four? Well, I think it's it is appropriate to look at the congressional elections. Um, the as as anyone who's listening undoubtedly knows, there's very slim majorities for the Republican in the House and the Democrats in the Senate. It's entirely possible that we could see either one party controlling both the House and Senate or split where they flip and the Democrats take over in the House and the Republicans take over in the Senate or somehow the status quo could be preserved. The interesting element here is that the four principles on the Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee are unlikely to change in terms of who they are. They just might end up handing the gavel to each other. So in the House, the Ways and Means Committee currently is chaired by Jason Smith of Missouri. Richard Neal of Massachusetts is the ranking minority member. If the Democrats win, everyone fully expects that Congressman Neal will take over the chairmanship. Similarly, in the Senate, where Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon is currently the chair, Mike Crapo, Senator from Idaho, the ranking minority member, they could easily hand over the gavel to each other because the Senate could easily be 51-49 or 52-48 going in the other direction. What does it mean if you have a Democratic majority in the House? Well, their priorities will certainly be a bit different from Republicans. But again, we have to look at who the president is, because part of being in the majority party, if your president is of your party, if the president is of your party, there has to be a little bit of loyalty to that president's agenda. So it really is going to depend a lot on whether or not you have Harris or Trump in the White House as far as how those committees handle trade. I do think, and I think my colleagues would agree, uh, that you know, the hacks legislative agenda is going to dominate over the trade legislative agenda. The 2017 massive tax law that was enacted during the first year of the Trump administration by the congressional Republicans on a party line approach, many of the provisions will come up, uh, they will sunset uh, unless Congress enacts something new over the next year. And of course, they can be extended for periods of time, but the Finance Committee and the Ways and Means Committee have primary jurisdiction over tax and trade, not to mention the Medicare system, a small issue, of course, for our nation. But uh, we really have to expect that those committees are going to focus first and foremost on tax and where they have an opportunity to get involved with trade, they will. I spoke with a couple of House Democrats on the Ways and Means Committee recently, and they said that um, they thought trade could achieve kind of a slipstream momentum whereby while the committee is doing a lot on the tax legislation, regardless of which party is in power, others could be working simultaneously behind the scenes on trade policy, be it in uh, free trade agreements, a rigorous oversight of a new USTR. So I think trade will be in the agenda, regardless of who is in the majority, but it's a question as to whether or not it gets the time that it truly deserves. One last point I'd like to make would be, and then I'd love for Kelsey to weigh in, is I don't think that all the Senate Republicans on the Finance Committee or more broadly in the Senate, I don't think all of them would agree to a broad-based new tariff hike, such as the one that pres uh, President Trump has described. So I think that we need to wait and see. Uh, I really do think, though, that vigilance is essential for any stakeholder. Uh, you can't just wait uh, and see what happens. You need to be up there explaining your priorities. Kelsey, what? What do you think? Uh, I know Bridget referred to a crystal ball earlier. I, I use a magic eight ball. I don't know what your technique is. Always a magic eight ball, Dan. I will just add some color, unintended, and say that there are a lot of congressional Republicans in deeply red Trump supporting districts that support free trade because those districts rely on either blue-collar manufacturing jobs that rely on cross-border supply chains with Mexico and Canada, or perhaps inputs from overseas that then get put into finished products here in the U.S., or agricultural districts that rely on steady, reliable access to, to foreign markets for their goods. So I think, as Dan said, any type of universal tariff will be met with opposition in Congress, uh, either for, again, access to those foreign markets and foreign inputs, or also for just um, fear of retaliatory 
tariffs on on those products as well. And I'd point okay. out, hey, Bridget, I'd point out, Kelsey mentioned, and I did the Magic 8-Ball, because of shrinkflation, it's now sold as a Magic 6-Ball. <laughs> um, let me just add something, too. We're running out of time, and I've got probably about four or five other questions, and I may ask the two of you to come back. But my observation on what was uh, just discussed is that the infusion or the injection of geopolitics and geopolitical tensions sort of relatively new in the modern trade area. I remember when trade agreements were negotiated based out of, I don't know, comparative advantage or regional advantage or trade deficits. Or, but now, as we've talked about today, it's all about or mostly about geopolitical concerns. And I think that the foreign entities of concern or friendly nations versus non-friendly nations, whatever they might mean, um, are not going to be the same under either a Trump or a Harris administration. They will have their separate lists. And to your point, Dan, and to Kelsey, it is so important to watch what is happening in Washington, who's on the Hill, and uh, what states are represented on these committees and what company production is taking place in those states. But we are out of time. But I did want to ask Dan one final question. Dan, you're the head of government relations at Aaron Fox Schiff. What are you hearing from clients? What are they asking of you and of our firm? And in today's turmoil, what is it that keeps them up at night? Well, I think that in the trade area, we've had clients ask us for briefings. We did a briefing for the board of directors of a foreign trade association last week about some of these very topics. People want to get a sense of what that they what they can expect, and they want to think about how to frame their narrative depending on who the listener is. If you have a Democratic president, Democratic House majority, Republican Senate, you can't necessarily use the same argumentation in every single office that you enter. And so we have a lot of people who are concerned that at a time uh, where so much is dependent on global trade, that some of what they need either will be front and center and not the way they like, or it will be relegated to the back burner uh, by other issues and they won't get the relief that they might need. So we're urging people to use November and December as a time of strategic planning. Uh, that's what we're doing with a lot of clients. And then to hit the ground running in January, when there's a new Congress sworn in and a new administration, regardless of who wins, it will be a new administration with new political appointees, uh, people to reach out to. I think that everyone is going to be insanely busy in the first quarter of the year advocating on their own behalf. And we look forward to the chance to partner with uh, our clients uh, in that effort. Thank you both. Dan and Kelsey can be reached by email and by phone. You can find their contact information at Aaron Fox Schiff, Google Government Relations. It'll be on the link to our electric mobility practice. And as I've said in many, many of our podcasts when I end them, smart in your world for Aaron Fox Schiff. It's not simply a tagline. And I am confident that this past conversation proves that point exactly. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Dan and Kelsey.